Okay, welcome to High Cheese with Darren Maloney. It's Friday, June 17th, 2022. And there's so much to talk about this week. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead with the uh, the Republican primaries that took place on Tuesday. And it was a good day for MAGA, as usual. All of the Trump endorsements have been doing extremely well. And in this case, we had Russell Fry, the MAGA candidate, winning the Republican nomination for one of the uh, congressional districts down in South Carolina. He beat Tom Rice, who voted to impeach Donald Trump. Then over in Nevada, we've had a MAGA victory in the Secretary of State with Jim Marchant. And then Paul Laxalt's son won the Republican primary for Senate. But the biggest, the biggest victory in my book is Myra Flores in the great state of Texas. Now, Flores won a special election for Congress in southern Texas, and she's the first Republican to win, I think, over in, in over 100 years. That, that is a Democrat that historically has been a Democratic bastion for 150 years until recently. Until Myra Flores came along. Hispanic woman. Hispanic Republican woman. And again, I, you know, I mentioned before, I, I don't like the term Hispanic because it kind of paints um, the people from South America and Central America with a broad b- brush. And there's clearly distinct countries and distinct cultures coming north into the United States. But again, it, it seems to be, everyone seems to accept it at this point. So I'm going to use that term, but, you know, ultimately it's much deeper. The Hispanic people are much deeper than just that broad brush. And they know it. We know it. I know it. But Myra Flores won. And this is indicative of the transformation that's been going on since Donald Trump became president of the two parties. We've been seeing the slow turn of Hispanics and working class people shifting from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party. And we're at the point now that the Democratic Party just is the party of the rich, high-tech business and centralized government people in Washington and other areas of the country. Whereas the Republican Party has taken over and taken the working class Hispanics, African Americans, and working class whites and have formed a new coalition with the middle class in this country. So what I want to do is I want to switch to a clip. And and, and Steve Bannon has n- hit this nail. And, and he's been aware of this for a number of years. And he's one of the few people that have spoken about what the reality is today. So let me play a clip. This is from Bannon. He was going to, uh, it was a press conference before his most recent court date. Um, the J6 uh, um Star Chamber has uh, had him indicted because he refuses to testify before them. So uh, a lot of you are aware that, uh, you know, this is what's going on with him. So let me just go to this press conference that he has uh, before he goes into court. And this, I think, occurred on uh, Wednesday, uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. But uh, uh, the point is, let's play it and then we'll come back and discuss. Look what happened last night in the Rear Grand Valley. This is an 84% Hispanic uh, district. It is the second most Hispanic district in the United States of America. We won a blowout. It's not even going to go to a runout. Flores won, I think, with 52% of the vote when you add up all the mega votes. 52%. We are on the rise democratically. We're going to win at the ballot box. We're going to have a blowout. We're going to have a 100 seat democracy. We, are, we believe in the ballot box. We believe in fair and free and transparent elections. We're winning everywhere. We're going to get 55 to 60 percent of the Hispanic vote this November. We're going to get 50 percent of the African American male vote this November. We're going to have a blowout win. We're going to win 80 to 100 seat pickup in the House of Representatives. We're going to win the Senate. We're going to win school boards. We're going to win. uh, We're going to throw these uh, source back DAs. We're going to win state legislatures. We're going to win all the secretaries of state that are running. We're going to win the governorships. We're going to win the state legislatures. This is going to be a massive blot like 1932. You're witnessing right now a political.
political realignment like 1932. And we will uprising of Hispanics, African Americans, and working class people in this country is before us. And you can see in the Rio Grande Valley, don't take it from Steve Bannon. Look at your own eyes. Yes. I'll come out after and talk. And Bannon is right. There is a shift going on. Last time we saw this was in 1932, after the Depression. But we've got Hispanics and male African Americans that have been screwed by the Democratic Party coming to the Republican Party. And when you think about it, you know, they're joining the white middle class, the white upper middle class also. And these new Hispanic Americans share so much with me, you. They're Christian. They believe in God. And they don't like oppressive government. And they want to work. And that's why they don't want to hear about these big government decisions. Because this is what they're running from. They don't like big government. They want to be they want to be left alone, just like you and me. They want to work, go home with their families, and live their life. The big aggressive governments, that's what they're running from. They're running from that, and they're running from lack of jobs. And they're coming here to have a better life. And again, I'm talking about the legal immigrants. Because if you ask the legal Hispanic immigrants, most of them don't want illegal immigration. Because it's taking their jobs away. It's reducing their value as a worker. And they're joining the Republican Party because the Republican Party knows about hard work. They know about Christianity. And they know about capitalism. And they don't like big centralized government. And just from an observation standpoint, I just think it's tremendous how quickly this turned. And I talked to people over a year ago, two years ago, saying, hey, this is happening. We've got a twist here going on. Ah, you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yes, I do. And Steve Bannon does too. And don't think that this has gone unnoticed by the Democrats and George Soros. Now, right now, George Soros is in the process of leading a group of investors that are going to buy 18 Hispanic radio stations throughout the country, including Radio Mambi in Miami. And Radio Mambi is the anti-communist radio station in Miami. So what they're doing, they're, they're, they're trying to control the airwaves. They know that they're losing the Hispanic vote. They know that they have nothing that appeals to the Hispanic voter. Politically, culturally, nothing. So they're going to buy up all these radio stations for two things. One, to prevent Hispanics, particularly in Miami, from listening to Radio Mambi. They'll just put it to bed. Or they'll just use it to ex expouse their own left-wing propaganda. So this purchase needs FCC approval. And let me just read an additional article from Breitbart, and it says here, Cuban dissidents urged the FCC to review the sale of anti-communist radio stations to Soros-backed leftists. So rightly so, Cuban Americans are up in arm with, about this. So the Assembly of the Cuban Resistance, a coalition of pro-democracy Cuban groups on and off the island, sent a letter on Tuesday to the head of the FCC, urging it to engage in a diligent review, including revealing all financiers of the proposed sale of the historic Spanish radio stations to the leftist network. So apparently this, this is just another game that Soros is playing to take away our freedoms. They're either going to take these radio stations and bury them or just put up their own propaganda. Now, I think they're going to be wrong with this because... Historically, left-wing radio never has done well for whatever reason. So I don't think you're going to see any real benefit to them. But here's the benefit. The benefit is when they can bury a popular anti-communist radio station, Radio Mambi, so people can't hear it. That's where they can do some damage. I just buy it. We'll buy it and bury it. And this is what corporations do to uh, uh, competition. They'll look at a smaller company out there and they say, oh, wait a second, this, this can turn into competition for us. Let's just buy it and bury it. And that's what Soros is doing here, I think. I'm not even sure if they're interested in having 
any left wing. I'm sure they'll try. But I think the important thing for Soros here is that they get to bury Radio Mombi. So like I've always said, forewarned is forearmed. So we know what's coming down the road, and hopefully the FCC can block this because we don't need George Soros owning Radio Mombi. And in the event that Soros does own Radio Mombi, we have to create our own new Radio Mombi. Now, we've got plenty of money on our side. It's not just Donald Trump. So we have to build a new Radio Mombi if this takes place. And we will. Because, again, we're smarter than they are. We're more resourceful than they are. And anytime they want to put up roadblocks to us, we can go around them. We know how to. They don't. They're not smart enough. We are. Okay, this economy is in really bad shape. Now, I think we're already in a recession. We'll find out later this month. But if not now, we're headed for a recession. At this point, I think everybody is in agreement, except maybe the White House, that it's only a question of how deep this recession is going to be, or worse. Now, what happened this week is in response to the uh, inflation number that came out two weeks ago, the Fed raised interest rates 0.75%, 75 basis points. Originally, they wanted to raise it one half of 1%, but the number, the CPI number that came out was so bad. And the markets are responding accordingly. They're tanking. The economy is tanking. And it's all because we've been lied to, we've been misled by all these so-called professionals. Oh, the inflation's just transitory, nothing to see here. Janet Yellen, oh, nothing to see here. And I think in my last ep- episode, she finally fessed up. Oh, I was wrong. And the interesting thing is she should be fired. But maybe she thinks she's got protection by Biden on this. But this is really bad. I, I'm telling you, as much as I remember 2008, this could be worse because in 2008 it was more of the market, Wall Street, the banks that were problematic. This is deeper than this. We've been artificially pumped up since 2008, our economy, the world economy, because of artificially low interest rates. So this economy we've been living in is just a charade. And now the chickens are coming home to roost. And nobody knows what the result is going to be. It's going to be bad, but just how bad, we don't know. We've got high inflation, and we've got a slowing economy. We've got high inflation, and we've got a recession. We've got high inflation, and maybe something worse. We just don't know. None of the experts know. But what I want to do with that that said, I I want to switch to... A clip from Bob Nardelli, and he's the former CEO of Home Depot. And he's given us some sobering advice here. And and the one reason you should listen to him, because he's he was the CEO of Home Depot. And I do think that retail guys, people in the retail business, have a very good sense of the economy. Because they're right on the front lines. It's not like Twitter where, okay, we, you know, you build your business on people tweeting and there's really no relationship between the tweets that uh, people provide and the underlying economy. However, with Home Depot, you do get a sense of what the economy is like because they're supplying builders, they're supplying homeowners with actual goods. So let's go to this clip And don't be disturbed by what he says. And then we'll come back and discuss. What do people at home need to know about this decision we are about to see announced by the Federal Reserve? Well, Sandra, um, it will have it will have a a continuing devastating impact on the consumers. Uh, We're seeing it every day. You're showing it on on the TV on your show. And if you look at not only inflation, but shrinkflation. You know, last time we spoke, I I predicted that inflation would continue to rise. Here we are at an 8.6 level in May. But I would tell you that is deceptively right. 
what do I mean? Shrinkflation is, is pervasive now. And the administration is not really doing anything to prevent it, so they must be encouraging it or condoning it. So every time you, you go to the store, what you're going to see is they're trying to avoid sticker shock, right? So you're paying $5 for something, for a consumable item. The fact is you may have 10, 20, 30 percent less in that bag or in that can. So that's that's really the inflationary number that doesn't always get mm -hmm. accurately reported in the 8.6. So I lived through 07, 8, 9 when I was running Chrysler and we had to run for cash. We had to hoard cash. So I would tell the consumer, make sure that you're building up cash reserves. I would encourage the consumer. Again, we saw what happened on, on baby formula. Build up a supply of non-perishables in your home. Make sure that you're prepared for sustainable uh, inflationary periods. Wow, I mean, Bob, I this is, these are dire warnings coming from you. I mean, I mean are you... You started out by saying that you believe that the effects of this interest rate hike will be devastating for the American consumer. But I should point out that the, the purpose of this dramatic potential action from the Fed is to try to tame inflation and bring those prices down. But to your point, because, because we've seen the Federal Reserve and this administration take so long to respond to these high prices, it's going to be a lot of short-term pain for long-term gain. Fair to say, though, that the end result is to bring prices eventually down. Uh, eventually down, but I've been around long enough now, 50 years in business, and I've been through these cycles, and sometimes, you know, from peak to valley, it's short, sometimes it's much more uh, prolonged, Sandra. Mm. I would tell you in the business community, we've been, we've been addressing, you know, we're on the outer edges of this hurricane starting in January. And we're really retrenching the way we do business. We're taking all of our orders and looking for the long lead item. And then we're reprofiling all of our material orders to make sure we don't build up inventory, that we don't lock up working capital, which yeah. is cash. We're trying to make sure that we are sustainable through this period uh, it's, of time. It's hard. What do you believe can be done today? Let's take gas prices. How do we bring those prices down? You've well, what really, what really scared me to death is when I heard the president and administration say, there's really nothing we can do to affect this period and this, uh, the situation that we're in today. That, that is just an uh, unconscionable response to the demands and the issues we're facing. Yeah. I ran the oil and gas business for General Electric for a number of years. All we have to do is allow for more drilling, which was stopped earlier in your program, the XL pipeline. You know, I think the, the, the energy companies are prepared and willing to do this, but they have been severely dampened, not only during this administration, but over a number of years. And one quick thing, Real quick. I wish these economists actually ran a business in, mm. in their career. They may have a different perspective. Now, there are two things that Nardelli is telling us. The first thing is, that please start accumulating cash, a little bit of cash on the side. Because with recessions, with the deep recessions, people start getting laid off. And you may need the additional cash to live off of until you find the next job. Secondly, he also points out, start storing up non-perishables. Because these non-perishables that you buy today, are going to be exponentially more expensive a month from now. Now, don't, don't start gasoline. There's nothing you can do with gasoline. That would be dangerous. I mean, you hear horror stories of people trying to store gasoline in their garage. Don't, don't do that. But that's what he's telling us. The other thing, too, is just he points out is that this has been going on for years, though. It's called shrinkage, and it's just reducing the size of the, of the product. A year ago, I used to be able to buy a bag of Wise Potato Chips for $2 for 10 ounces. Now it's going to be $2 for 5 ounces. But they're not going to tell you. It's, the bag's going to be the same, but inside you're going to get 5 ounces of potato chips instead of 10. So just be aware of that, too. And if it comes down to you not buying those potato chips, don't buy them. And the funny thing is, Sandra Smith, she's the uh, talking head for Fox. She's the one that interviewed Nardelli. You know, she cuts him off because he was being too real. And her job is to pump everything up. She's a cheerleader. Got to keep the markets up. Got to keep everything up. Doesn't matter. Just keep it up. 
So she, she tries to cut off Nardelli and say, well, you know, isn't the real intent is to, by raising interest rates, you're going to cut event, uh, inflation eventually? And then she implies, well, it's going to be a short term. And Nardelli comes back and says, well, wait a second. No, that's not the case here. And then he kindly implies that this is going to be not a short recession. This is going to be longer. So again, if this was an economist saying this, some economist from Harvard, I wouldn't put too much into it. But I do believe Nardelli on this. He's a retail guy. He un understands retail. He's got his finger on the pulse of the American economy. So listen to what he says. Don't listen to me. Listen to Nardelli. Okay, let me give you a summary of the markets today. It's ugly. Let me just say the Dow for the week was down. The S&P for the week was down. And NASDAQ for the week was down. Year to date, the Dow is down 17.75%. The S&P is down for the year 22.9%. And NASDAQ is down 30.98%. And there's some Wall Streeters that are saying we're only halfway there. What are the Democrats doing? And this is why the Democrats are losing the Hispanics. One of the reasons. The country is in chaos financially. And what is Joe Biden spending his time doing? Well, first of all, his administration says, ah, we can't do anything anymore. So we got Joe Biden signing an executive order this week that directs federal health and education agencies to expand access to gender-affirming care and advance LGBTQ inclusive learning environments at American schools. So essentially what he's doing is he's trying to expand the ability to your kids to mutilate their genitals without your approval. Now we also have Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi shows up on RuPaul's Drag Race. It's a weekly program on VH1 that features drag queens. So Nancy Pelosi comes out and she says, it's an honor to be here. Your freedom of expression of yourselves in drag is what America is all about. No, I don't think so. And there's a lot of gay and lesbians that don't think so either. There's a lot of gays and lesbians that resent the fact that you're lumping them with drag queens. So that's what they're doing. They're spending their time We've got $5 a gallon gasoline. And what are they doing? They're holding these crazy hearings to try to get Donald Trump. You got Biden signing executive orders that make it easier for kids to mutilate themselves. You've got Nancy Pelosi on RuPaul's Drag Race. And this is comical. You got to see these guys. These guys, big guys, dressed up. They look like clowns. And what's next? It's, you know, my wife is telling me there's these group of people that are, they like to dress up in uh, costumes, like big pandas, you know, big bears. And that's their identity. Are they now going to be part of this alphabet soup? Well, I have a right to dress up at, as a panda bear, go to work. This is absolutely bizarre. And what really gets me is you got the attorney general of Michigan claiming we need a drag queen in every school. And let me play this clip and then we'll come back. I need this, a drag queen for every school. That, that is what would be fine for a kid and lift them up when they're having emotional issues. Now the attorney general's name is Dana Nessel and she was speaking to an educational seminar and look, it appears she was joking about it, but only in a half-hearted way. So again, it goes back to these are the important issues to Democrats. Not $5 per gallon gas, not inflation, not baby formula, but putting a transvestite in every classroom. Okay, with that, I just want to switch to the J6 hearings. The J6 hearings... Uh, oh my God, I've been watching it. It's putting me to sleep. I don't know what else to say. All, all is just get, uh, on today's episode of Get Trump, we're going to bring in a federal judge that's going to put everybody to sleep and mumble his way through the hearings. 
And then we're going to splice some pictures together and we're going to tell tell you how all the attorneys around Trump said that uh, uh, the election was legitimate. So I just, yeah, it's just, it, it's a joke. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. Now, in my last episode, I, I mentioned that, look, I was disappointed in Bill Barr. And I was saying that the FBI doesn't want anything to do with looking into voter fraud. It's beneath them. Their attitude is, oh, you know, they both sides cheat. And again, there's the political aspect of it, too, is that uh, when you start really going into this, when you have an FBI agent really thoroughly going into election fraud, there's going to be winners and losers. And because they're political hacks, they don't want to wind up on the wrong side of the win. And with that said, you know, Governor DeSantis, again, he really is helping restore faith, or at least... He's at least on the cutting edge of doing something about voter fraud. And I guess it was it was on April 25th, he approved the creation of a new standalone election police force designed to crack down on voter fraud in the nation's third largest state. The Republican governor had proposed the creation of a special unit to tackle election crimes as he came under pressure from some Republicans to do a full-blown audit in 2020, for 2020. And I think this is a good idea because you're not going to get it on the federal level. They're too political, but you can get it on the state level. And I think DeSantis is doing the right thing. Because you have to do more than just a, I don't see any pictures here. I don't see anybody filling out anything illegal. I don't see a picture of a guy voting twice. And these guys know, the FBI knows that the fraud takes place well before election day. It's the gathering of the ballots. It's the paying people for their vote. That's where the fraud is. The fraud is going up and down affordable housing units and telling them they must vote for this candidate or we're going to kick you out. That's the fraud. The fraud is when you get Meals on Wheels, home delivery service, telling elderly people that if you don't, Vote for this candidate. I'm not going to feed you. That's the fraud. But you will not get any FBI agent to look into that. And the media doesn't feels the same way. Uh, you know, we we don't see anything. You know, election fraud is only when somebody votes twice or three times. That's not where the fraud is. The fraud is on the ground level. The fraud is twisting arms. That's where the fraud is. And I'm glad DeSantis is doing this because they can pick it up. Okay, let me give you an update on Ukraine. I haven't talked about Ukraine in a couple of episodes, so let me just give you the latest. And uh, Pope Francis came out uh, a week or two ago, and Pope Francis has told a group of European Jesuit news editors that the war in Ukraine was perhaps somehow either provoked or not prevented. And he cautioned against oversimplifying the conflict. In an interview published Tuesday, In a Jesuit publication, the Pope said that in Russia's war on Ukraine, there are no metaphysical good guys and bad guys in the abstract sense. He said that months before the war, a head of state warned him that NATO was barking at the gates of Russia and that Russia would not tolerate it, which could lead to war. Just like I said, why didn't Zelensky know this? He had 200,000 troops on his border. And he didn't think they were going to attack. But that's for a later date. So in the interim, we've, we've had the, the president of France, Italy, and Germany visit Zelensky in Kiev this week. And I think the EU extended or said they were going to offer Ukraine an invitation to join. Now, the process is a little more elaborate than was described in the media. Apparently, there's uh, the offer has to go through the existing EU members, and they have to approve it. And then there's certain thresholds or benchmarks that Ukraine has to meet. And once they do that, they can join. Now, usually they say the, the whole process takes about five years. And the funny thing, Macron came out and said that, hey, well, you know, they're offered the invitation, but, you know, you got to know that Ukraine would not have been offered this invitation 
if it wasn't for the war. Well, that doesn't make sense. Why give it to them now? Because they're, they're fighting? I'll tell you why. They're setting up, they have to set up something that Putin loses because of this war. They've got, they're trying to create a narrative because Putin, look, Putin's going to keep that land that he's overtaken already. Now he's got between 20, 25% of, of the land of Ukraine right now in the East. He's not moving from there. So what happens is that you've got the West and you've got the globalists. Well, if Putin keeps that, we said and we allow Putin to keep the, the 25% of the Ukrainian country, we've got to show the world that there was something that Russia lost. And what Russia lost is they're going to say, well, you know, uh, if it wasn't for the war, uh, Ukraine would not be in the uh, EU. So because of the war, Ukraine's going to join the EU. And that's going to be part of their narrative. And it's a weak narrative. And here's the funny thing is that, you know why the reason they were never going to allow Ukraine into the EU before the war? Because Ukraine is the third most corrupt country in the world. That's why. And Macron let the cat out of the bag. So I'm not supporting Putin. I'm not supporting the globalists either. This is a European problem. There's no vital interest for us in the United States in that area. So anyway, make a long story short, Russia continues to slowly but surely take land, and they're brutal. They're just constantly throwing artillery into these cities, just leveling them, just killing everything in its path. And they're slowly taking more and more ground. And Zelensky's got a problem. I, I forgot who wrote the article, but he was saying what I've always been saying. How does Zelensky settle when most people know or will know that he could have avoided war by just giving up the Donbass region and accepting the fact that it's separate from Ukraine? That likely could have appeased Putin. He didn't want you going into NATO. You're not getting into NATO. So we shall see. As I've said, time is not going to be a friend to Zelensky. Okay, let's take a quick look at the markets before I go. Uh, I covered the Dow earlier in the episode, so let's just take a look at oil. It's 7 o'clock in the evening on Friday, June 17th, 2022, and oil is trading at $110.48. Gold futures is trading right now at $1,841.90 an ounce. Uh, silver futures is trading at $21.63. Uh, Bitcoin Bitcoin is trading at $20,450.05. Ethereum is trading at $1,085.34. And XRP is trading at $0.32. Cents. So with that said, I want to thank everyone for listening. I hope you had a good week and hang in there. At some point, it will get better. Thanks for listening.